All right, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for joining me, and thank you, Steve, for having me on here. This is a little bit of a different environment that I'm used to. It's usually one-on-one -on, -one on the phone, and um, working uh, by email or just talking. So I do encourage you to be interactive to kind of help this go smoothly here. So yep. uh, my name is Galen Garish. I grew up in Missouri. Jim Garish is my father. You probably uh, a lot of you know him uh, from his books, Man Management Intensive Grazing and Kick the Hay. I joined American Grazing Land back in 2014 after my wife and I decided to move back from New York. I was working for the DOE then, and it was, uh, it was a job that wasn't all that fulfilling, and I wanted to get back to my roots, and, and it has, my path has led me here. So I head up sales for American Grazing Land. Um, my mom, Dawn Garrett, she started that back in 2005 and she is actually in the uh, fencing business since 1995 and that was called uh, Green Hills Grazing which she sold to PowerFlex Fence. Some of you probably have, are aware of them and that's what I'll leave for introduction. Okay so starting off I want to just uh, get everybody Give, a, give everybody an idea of what tools are available online that can assist you in planning your grazing cell. Uh, the first tool is Google Earth Pro. It's a very um, user-friendly interface. You can map uh, out your entire farm, determine what your grazable areas are, and share that uh, that information with your um, whoever your agronomist your extension agent whoever you're working with it's um, important for planning out your your post spacing this will aid you and your labor force in determining the future pasture size for feed allocation using portable fencing. The other tool is the USDA soil and survey map and uh, productivity tool. And that is a massive pre-existing database with soil maps of your grazing area, and they're expected for its production by uh, for its species. It'll help you determine what your stocking rate should be. Figures are provided. They are often conservative and can be surpassed in a few years under good MIG practice. And other tools that you should use when planning your your grazing system is uh, contact your local extension agent or give uh, myself or Jim a call over at American Grazing Lands. Okay, so we're, first we're going to start with uh, permanent portable stock water systems. Okay, so when we're thinking about developing in stock water, we need to understand why should we do it. All right, let me go ahead and mute my phone now. Okay, so why it matters. The strategic placement of watering points ensures good transport and distribution of nutrients through manure and urine. If uh, you place a watering point on the top of a ridge, animals are more likely to uh, tra travel there and nutrients travel downhill. The distance that a herd has to travel to water will determine their grazing manure and nutrient distribution. So, there are quite a few studies out there that show grazing distribution, um, the uniformity of it, it really starts to drop off after about 900 feet in normal pasture land. Uh, 
So providing good water for the entire grazing uh, herd ensures not only healthier animals, but better weight gains and increased profitability. And then in this picture, obviously that is not developed stock water. Um, you give animals access to ponds and creeks and pretty soon you have a real mess on your hands. So plan your stock water system. Determine what grazing areas do not already have adequate water coverage. So in the Midwest, you uh, really don't want your animals traveling any further than a quarter of a mile away from that watering point. And it's a bit further on dry rangeland. You can see it's a half to one mile, depending on the roughness of terrain. And then you need to calculate your herd demand to determine what size your trough needs to be, how large your water pipe needs to be. And then remember, size your system according to the worst day, not the average one. All right, once you have determined your pipe size, you can begin to shop around. HDP and PVC are the most common type of pipe used in stock water systems. PVC costs are comparable and sometimes cheaper, but I will not be covering uh, that too much here. In some areas, PVC may be the best option. Be sure to check with your local extension agency to see which type of pipe you should be using. Uh, it, those situations would be uh, where PVC would be preferable is I, I found in a place like Oklahoma or North Texas, the um, groundhogs and uh, even prairie dogs, they actually like to chew on HDPE. So um, it's HDP is not a good choice there and PVC is. All right, and these are some prices uh, that you can kind of figure. Prices do change a lot based on the uh, cost of oil. And something that's really important to remember is that when you increase your pipe size by, um, it, well, if you double it, you're actually quadrupling your water flow. So uh, it's not a bad idea to take what your, uh, whoever designed your pipe system, whether it's you or uh, some engineer or uh, extension agent, and maybe add a, another quarter inch onto that just to protect yourself. So that looks pretty easy right there. That um, is a subsoiler and you have a uh, roll of HDP that just being um, it's actually attached to a, a front end loader or the strap through the, the spool and it's just above the ground and that is making fast work of the installation there. And there you see a, a track hoe and this was in Missouri um, in southern Missouri and they dug miles and miles of this stuff and it was very labor intensive. The result was great. They're happy, but the time putting it in, uh, you know, does leave some of the economic benefits. All right, so let's talk about why HDP pipe is good. Um, it's a it's a great over the surface option. And it contains uh, UV inhibitors as you see there, which means you can run it over the surface and in, uh, in a scenario where you're not, you're not able to bear, and we're actually gonna cover that in a little bit. So sorry, let me back up there. All right, so 
Uh, it's also freeze resistant. I don't like to test. I have seen it freeze and thaw out and not uh, burst. And don't I don't really like to test it, but uh, the, the pipe manufacturers do claim that it's freeze proof, but I still don't like to test it. All right, it's flexible and can be used in almost every grazing application. So whether you're installing a permanent line or a portable line, uh, you can target specific areas with HDPE pipe and do it very effectively. So there's some different types of HDPE that require different connection methods and when uh, somebody calls me and they say that they've got a, a great steal on, you know, some pipe, uh, sometimes it's CTS, copper tube size pipe, and finding, you know, some compatible fittings for that might be difficult. But um, the most two, the two most common type are the SIDR and the SDR. So the SIDR uh, is standard inside dimension ratio. And you can find all of these, uh, the pipe designation, actually on the pipe, it's that uh, between the, the white line on it. And it will say something like SIDR 9 or 11. And what that is, that is denoting the pipe thickness uh, relative to the, on SIDR, the, the diameter, the inside diameter of the pipe. And then, SDR is an outside controlled diameter pipe, so the, the dimension ratio is calculated from the outside of the pipe. So uh, SDR 11, 200 PSI pipe is the most common pipe that we supply, and it is joined by either fusion or over the pipe unions, like your compression fittings, Phil Maxwell class, and Plasson. And SIDR can be fused as well as joined together with an insert fitting. Typically you'll get coils that are anywhere, uh, 500 is the most common length. It's a little bit easier to ship that way. Shipping costs aren't gonna be so exorbitant, but if you can find those longer lengths locally, great. It can be, uh, sometimes you don't need to break the line, so continuous lines are best. I see we have a question here. I'm going to just pull that up. Okay, so it, it, uh, can HTP be buried below frost line with the trencher shown? In our area, the frost line is going to get down to about four feet. And yes, you can trench it in below that. Um, the five feet is about the absolute uh, max for a subsoiler. So um, in some areas, yes. Up in Canada, probably not. And then yes, you do have to go with uh, some sort of trencher, the trenching system. Okay, and then uh, the last part here is that, that shipping is a large part of a water project. Um, I, you know, even though uh, we, we sell and recommend these supplies, if somebody can get, you know, uh, a quality product locally, by all means, I, I love the support, but definitely um, help yourself there. And, and look local. If not, you know, we're happy to, to accommodate. Um, one other thing, and this goes for uh, fencing supplies as well, is to try to convince your neighbor or, you know, uh, somebody, family in your area that, um, well, I say convince, but ask them if they're planning on putting in an order. And you can very quickly get the cost of shipping down. So, idea there. Okay, so uh, Steve asked me to focus more on uh, like temporary use. 
and uh, mostly for lease property because uh, land, if you don't already have it, is kind of hard to get. And so uh, hopefully I can hit some of that. And if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to oblige. Uh, I have a list here of media re reasons you may not want to or cannot bury waterline. So first off, th th this happens all the time uh, with people that we talk to. They're new to rotational grazing and they're not sure how it's going to work. You know, how it's going to uh, say, for instance, they do, they own a, a, lar uh, a large ranch or a, a you know, big, large area. And they don't really want to change the the flow of it too much. <laughs> I'm speaking mostly uh, to the Western ranches that you know they have these huge open ranches, and they don't really want to change too much about it. But they kind of, they see the benefit of rotational grazing, and so they want to just dip their toe in it. And so they you know talk about uh, installing temporary fencing and uh, watering. And then uh, the next reason would be targeting a new grazing area. And in a lot of places, and depending on the distance from water to shade and shade to water, water is a more powerful attractant than shade. Now that depends, you know, probably some on, on breeding, color of animals, stuff like that. But, um, plenty of studies that show that water had a more more of an influence in uh, grazing and manure distribution than shade did. So and the next reason is that you want to mitigate your costs. So you want to install a system but it costs quite a bit to, to put in the ground. If you're looking at a thousand or ten thousand feet you're looking at you know a thousand dollars on insulation and um, you know somewhere in there sometimes a lot more actually and then uh, <clears throat> sometimes you just run out of time you need the water and you have a hydrant and so you just put a adapter with a threaded adapter with either a barb fitting or a compression fitting and you go ahead and run it out to where you need to and you can go ahead and get water out to a tank same with a uh, a pump. You can tee off of that and run a new line out. All right, so on lease land, um, which is just the most intriguing you know, topic for uh, prospective grazers and contract grazers, but um, so you, you, you found some land, but the landowner is not willing to, um, you know, pay the costs and you don't have the money to do that. So what you could do is you could suggest uh, applying for a government cost share program, um, you know, some sort of an incentive program to go ahead and uh, help pay for that. Or you can, another great idea is just to see if they'll take it off, the, off your pasture land. And then the other one is that the area was really just part of a crop rotation program and, you know, putting in pipe in wasn't, uh, you know, part of the plan all along. All right, so tools of the trade uh, and this, and a lot of these apply to permanent water installation, but and I'd love to know how many are familiar with the product on the left, the, the yellow cap valve, but that's the plastic quick coupler valve. And I have yet to find a more um, just convenient access to water. So if anybody could uh, just shoot a comment or, you know, um, I don't know if that's how it works, Steve, but <laughs> I wish there was some sort of just uh, thumbs up or something, you know, like, yeah, we, we, we know about this, uh, it's a good product, or maybe you don't like it. But anyway, we've, we've been using for uh, decades. Now, 
we had them installed all, all over the farm in Missouri and they worked really really well um, when you install them above ground you do have to be mindful to not put them to where cows can step on them they're a plastic product um, much like, like the toys in my house you step on them they break so and that's that's about the most uh the, the, the biggest issue that i've ever had with those is just livestock stepping them on an over the surface uh, watering system love them they're great if they freeze no not not a big deal uh so what you can do is uh in permanent stock water line put a pvc well over them like a six to eight eight inch pvc well that you can access put uh the, the water line is below the frost level so it's open but the the water that is left in the valve when you disconnect your quick coupler from your tank sometimes that freezes up and it was just common practice to take a gallon of hot water out with us every time we went out to the pasture and slowly thaw it out and then it was freed up and then we plug in and go ahead and fill up the tank i have a question here i want to address all right pretty fun yeah. <laughs> uh margaret margaret says uh pretty fun of the quick couplers have used them for years uh, yeah and galen i was gonna say too if anybody else um agrees with margaret it looks like you can go in and give a thumbs up to margaret's comment so we can get an idea how many of you are are familiar with those plastic and couplers yeah it looks like a few people there okay awesome awesome and then um the rubber mates tank and that is your um 150 gallon which isn't necessarily for portable reasons the easiest tank to move the 100 gallon and the 50 gallon are much easier to move and sure they can be kind of trashed and thrashed but for the most part they're very durable uh, portable water tanks and we've had a lot of success with those you can water if the source provides an incredible amount of livestock with just a single tank and then you see the little blue float there and if you just move over to the right you can see what that blue float is the apex extra flow water valve and that one is the long tail and you can tell it's the long tail by the the, the longer thread and the nut and the gasket that's on the thread, just the regular ones will just have a shorter thread. And the, the long tail, this is a question that I get quite a bit, is what does that mean? What's the long tail? It, it, does it have something to do with the nylon cord? No, it, it actually just means that the thread is longer. You have that flange just below the outlet, and then you have the nut and gasket. Those are all unique to the long tail. So that is for, um, uh, so in, in this instance, the Rubbermaid tank, if that's a three quarter inch long tail valve, you would wanna drill a seven eighths inch hole in it and then thread that valve in. It's a very tight seal, even without the nut and gasket, but once you put the nut and gasket in, you do have a water tight seal. And um, the, the product on the right, the apex water valve and the product on the left, the class and quick coupler and the male riser that you see sticking out the top of that, those are joined together just by, you can kind of see it just off to the left of the Rubbermaid, a garden hose. Garden hose is one, you, you can use other types of hosing. Um, but that is pretty much most common. So Gary asked, what does it do? All right. Yeah, I think uh, Gary was asking in reference when you were talking about the plast and couplers there, if you maybe could uh, explain that uh, the benefits of those real briefly again. Okay. Um, all right, so those plast and quick couplers, uh, I apologize, it's not a great representation of what that is because it's actually screwed into a compression fitting. The 
uh, the unit on the left is screwed into a an elbow. So there's a three quarter inch threaded female uh, piece on that, and then it's a uh, just a compression nut on the other side. And then on the right you have the the T with the threaded off take there. So if you can imagine in between those two, you have your HDP pipe and it's joined and it's charged with water. So the, uh, and then <laughs> the other part that's not a, a great representation of it is that the male coupler is already plugged into it. So the top piece there, you have a little clip that clips onto that large lip around the top. If you press on the top up near where the threads are on the, on the top of the, the male end riser, it will go ahead and disconnect and the valve will close. So when the system is charged and you push the coupler in, what that does is actuate the valve. It goes, goes ahead and opens it. So you have water and that's why the, when you do plug it in, it's connected to a valve and it begins to fill the tank. Great, thanks, Galen. And just one quick note too, um, it, it, for future reference, we, if you, if it's helpful, you know, we can see your mouse that can act as like a laser pointer if you wanted to kind of point to the specific details of an image going forward. Just, to, just so you know. Oh, brilliant! Yeah, I'm. A... Okay, so this is the male riser. That's very helpful, Steve. Actually, that's that's going to help out a lot. Um, and this is the lip that I was talk, uh, saying it clips to. And so that, that piece comes out, that's its own piece and that's attached to your line that's then attached to your tank valve over here. And then that tank valve goes in through the other side of the tank. And while I'm pointing things out with the mouse and Steve was so great to you know, point, point that out to me, um, that little drain pour right there don't try to put this into it. The threads just don't match up and it causes, uh, it'll leak pretty much. So, um, Gary, you can ask me if that, or you can ask me if that answered, or let me know if that answered your question. But moving on here. Okay, so, uh, just in relation or uh, speaking of quick coupler valves, where do you put them? You know, in most situations, 100 feet to 200 feet is beneficial. If you have larger areas, then, you know, it might be more beneficial to go ahead and put them out at every 500 feet. Uh, coils of HTP come in 500 foot lengths, so you could almost entirely uh, do the, the whole uh, watering system without uh, just um, without installing any couplers, just using T's as your couplers, if that if that makes sense. But here is kind of a cool picture of a leased property in Long Island, New York, and it's just a representative. Like this is a small sample of. Um, uh, Greg Judy has a great book, No Risk Ranching, that will, if, you, if you've read it, will get you kind of fired up about going out and looking for you know, some idle land. And that's what this uh, producer did on Long Island. He has, uh, to, to my knowledge, three farms on Long Island. But anyway, this, um, this is a very basic layout of, from hydrant of, of a, a basic over the surface pipeline. So from the, uh, just the hydrant off the house and then it runs um, down and then we start our grazing cells. And these cells are a little bit more long and rectangular than I like, but you know, it's, they're on a uh, good pasture. These are finishing animals and from what I hear, he has a great product. Okay, so next piece is installing an over the surface pipeline. And to skip ahead, um, 
Fences will almost always be built over your water lines, and this is more of a note, but th this serves multiple purposes. The important being the ability to serve as many grazing areas as possible, protect the water line from hooves and tires, the area around the pipe should hardly be grazed, creating a growing shade structure that will keep the water cooler. Cool water is very, uh, very important. And when you have uh, large diameter pipes, uh, a thousand feet of two inch pipe that's just been baking out in the Mississippi sun, that is a massive volume of hot water. So even in lease scenarios where the landowner is not willing to um, put in a permanent uh, water line based on installation costs or whatever, just ripping the ground in a few inches, um, but put it in a you know, foot and you're gonna have cooler water and you will have better wa uh, animal performance. So, Next, the, the size of the pipe will determine the method and the equipment necessary for unrolling. Three quarter inch to one quarter, or inch and a quarter can be unrolled fairly easy by hand. Um, you don't need that big giant metal spool that you, you know, going back uh, to the beginning of the presentation that you saw on the subsoiler. It can be unrolled by hand. And <laughs> I've seen some pretty, you know, if you're, if, you're just a, a do-it-yourselfer and you don't have a lot of, um, if you don't have any access to uh, tractors or uh, any type of farm equipment, there's some really good ways of spooling out pipe that is larger, uh, like in the, the inch and a half to even four inch. Some pretty cool ideas there. But pretty much three quarter inch to inch and a quarter, you can run that out by hand very fairly easily. Uh, take into account that an above ground pipe will constantly be expanding and contracting. So this is a again a massive problem with an over the surface pipe um, is that you uh, if, if you just skip down a couple points here that a hundred foot section of HDP pipe has the capability of shrinking several inches almost to a foot if there's a dramatic shift, dramatic shift being about 40 degrees, 30 to 40 degrees from day to night temps. And that's why it's important to make all of your pipe connections in the early morn. But going uh, back up here, so give the pipe some slack. That means uh, just Kind of running across the ground like a snake, not too much, but just a little bit of de uh, deviation, maybe a foot off to the left, to the right, and do not tie it. Um, well, if you have to, you can tie it to a post just to keep it from coiling back on itself, but certainly don't leave it tied off because that creates an anchor point, which then the pipe will pull from once it starts to. Uh, shrink at nighttime and it will pull it will completely pull uh, insert fittings and uh, compression fitting uh, pieces apart okay so installing over the surface pipeline continued uh, make a square cut and for smaller pipes I found that Ratchet cutters are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty handy. They create a chamfered edge. They don't produce a lot of burrs. They don't create a bunch of uh, shredded pipe waste in the in the pipe, which can create failure down line in your uh, your quick couplers and your valves. Sorry, my dog for, for barking there. I've got four of them in the house. <laughs> if you're um, if you're going to use SIDR pipe with insert fittings, make sure you use two hose clamps per side, tie in in opposing directions. That's just um, common sense when working with plumbing. Um, but you know, a lot of uh, 
people just getting into, they're excited about making a difference. They're going to uh, get started on some ranching and grazing. They don't necessarily know everything that we take for granted. And I apologize, Steve. If you just give me one second, I'm going to let my dogs outside so they stop barking. Yeah, that's not a problem. I guess uh, in the meantime, folks, while Galen's running to let, I think he said four dogs <laughs> while he's letting his dogs out. Um, you know, he did say that he, he loves to take questions. So if you have any questions that pop up as he's, as he's going through, don't hesitate to put them in the chat box. So um, if you want some clarification or anything on this, so we're on, you know, um, water lines right now, we will get to fencing. So try and keep it a little on topic, but definitely ask your questions if you got it. I, def okay, I, uh, I recognize a lot of PFI members in here, and I know a lot of you are known for asking a lot of questions, so don't hesitate. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Galen. Looks like I skipped ahead there. Okay. Um, all right. Another, another thing I'd be really interested in is how many of you are familiar with compression fittings. And I'm not selling compression fittings as a better option than BARB because I don't necessarily believe that they are. Uh, bar fittings have been around a lot longer and most people are used to working with them but for the people for the folks that have used compression fittings I get kind of I get mixed reviews on them and uh, typically what it comes down to you know for the those of us, us that can admit that we possibly made some mistakes that it was the technique that was employed when putting these pieces together and there are uh, some pretty specific directions about in installing them which makes them a bit of a headache where you know you look up here he's just heating up his pipe and he's going to put that compression fitting in there slap a couple of hose clamps on it and do the same on this side and he can walk away pretty confident. And I think that's a huge selling point on insert fittings. But, you know, sometimes, um, I mean, we, we're kind of restricted to what's available. And a lot of times the, the SDR is the, is the, the, pop, uh, the pipe of choice there, or it's the most affordable choice. So I'm going to just take take a look at the Q&A here. Hi, <laughs> my, <dog's, laughs> my dog says hi to yours. Use clamps at all. On insert fittings, absolutely. But not on the compression fittings. The compression fittings require you to insert the pipe inside of... Uh, sorry, Steve. How do I minimize the the zoom bar down here? There you go. I, I just have to clear out the questions and then that should minimize itself. So I think that should be good now. Okay. So the compression fitting, uh, the, the inside pipe hole ends about right there and you need to ins uh, insert the pipe clear into that wall. There's a gasket and a grip ring inside there. Uh, the gasket compresses once you tighten the nut down and creates a, a nice seal. These are actually, um, what, what makes them nice is that they are a little bit more of a temporary or portable option, since that's what we're talking about. Uh, they can be reused, taken off and, and reassigned. So you hook, if you hook on to a frost free hydrant, how many feet of water line can you expect to run? Well, that all depends. Uh, I assume that it, this is coming off of metered water, not well water, but um, 3,000 feet is not impossible. But we have to take into account your herd size. We need to take into account the elevation that we're going to be uh, gaining or losing, hopefully losing. 
and then the number of uh, it is from well okay yeah so you can put quite a bit on there uh, do you have a distance in mind thousand feet. Hey, Kurt, if you wouldn't mind um, emailing me, my contact inform information will be at the end of this, but I can certainly uh, run some calculations for you and give you a good idea whether or not based on, you know, what your uh, gallon per minute supply is, and then look at, uh, you know, a topo map or an elevation profile of that line, you know, what it would require. And that's, the, you know, that's the the least I could do is just show you what it would require on the end um, to make that work. So after everything's hooked together, uh, charge your system and check for leaks. Because if it's your first time and <laughs> you're pretty good with, uh, well, that, that goes for insert fittings and compression fittings, just check it for leaks. And that's the that is, you know, the benefit of an over the surface pipe is you are able to view it where if you rip that in, that's going to be a little bit tougher to, you know, go back and, and see if you have any leaks in the system. And if you're on metered water, a leak can really cost you. So whatever you choose, make sure that you are comfortable with it and that you understand it. All right, so as far as um, th these are just kind of a couple cool portable ideas that I've seen implemented. Uh, this fellow on the right is my good buddy Sean Mallet of Harmony Organic Dairy in Twin Falls, Idaho. And what he has here is a couple of troughs and uh, there's a Hudson valve installed in there. But this is a, just a portable skid and he has this line that he can kind of pull wherever and um, you know, that can water a heck of a lot of dairy cows. And then over here, we have the portable uh, <laughs> trough and reel system. As you can see, there's a nine horse uh, combustion engine on there that can pull. Um, and I'm not sure how many feet is honest, I don't uh, recall but it's a pretty good amount. And anyway, and then he has two 50 Rubbermaid tanks over here. And that, a uh, pretty, pretty novel idea there. I like that. Okay, so moving on to permanent talk, uh, stock water systems. Hey, Galen. Take this question. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a question here. Another point, another thing I was gonna mention too is that, um, uh, we might need to speed up the pace a little bit because um, I know you've got a few slides before we get to fencing and we're at uh, 7.50 central time. So just a heads up to, I don't know, you know, get through them. I yeah, guess. I wasn't sure how this was going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it, it's a new, like a new format. I'm, I'm very comfortable talking one-on-one -on -one presentation. I'm not Jim Garrish, so this is this is new, but I will try to speed along. Um, let me just try to get this question. Just logged in, so I missed again. What's the best way to get water over hill above pond? Um, so you might need a pump or siphon. Uh, I might need additional water sources for more paddocks. Solar pump, kind of expensive. I have no electricity or water power. Just have gravity fed waters now. Two ponds in eighty acres. They feed three waters. Okay, Eric, if you would not mind, uh, just getting a hold of me after this and we can work out a system because we kind of need to look at the, the larger picture there take a look at the map the elevation profile and then get some more details on the, the type of animals that you have and all that stuff so I'll, I'll try to move on a little bit faster here uh, so that is a water block yeah all right 
Um, so there is a finished water block. Uh, tire tank, very, if you can get these local, great options. You, uh, I mean, I've looked around and talked to people, and as far as the rubber leaching chemicals into the water, it doesn't seem to be an issue. This, uh, this water block here, um, I believe it's a 40 by 40, which that can serve up to 400 head. I'm not sure if that's how many they had on here. Uh, once again, this is Missouri, but anyway, so. All right, this, this is just kind of the schematic of building a water block. Uh, the idea, and this is the, the most typical setup here. You have um, four fences coming in, creating four paddocks and then you have a watering point in the center. The watering point is, um, it's very, con sorry, I'm backing up here and touch anything. Okay, it's kind of a, a sacrificial area. You are gonna have to give up some of that potential uh, grass, but, and that's why it's important to keep it to uh, appropriately sized if, um, as you can see here, increase 10 feet side, or 10 feet per side per 100 head above one, uh, 400. So that's saying if you have 500 head, uh, have a 50 by 50. But you are growing that uh, area quite a lot. Um, on a 40, you're going from 1,600 square feet to 2,500 when you extend it 10 feet per side. So we don't want to waste. And then uh, you, you can see here the electric poly rope gates. And that is just to frame out the watering area for the cattle. And then they either will move into the next paddock over here or they're going to move away. And depending on what the scenario is, they can either come back. And as long as Pretty much uh, back grazing is not much of a concern up to about five days then you get new grass and you want to go ahead and get them moved off and on to the next water so man I feel like this is gonna burn up a lot of my time here and you're just getting rolling but uh, so this is building a water block with the tire tank setting the tank and I hope that this is interesting to, to some of you but um, picking a good spot, picking, uh, going back to Google Earth or whatever, you know, finding that good central location. And you don't want to put too many permanent fences off of this. You don't want to create that spoke pattern. You want to graze more, uh, you know, that's a pie shape. You want to graze more of a square to rectangular shape pattern. And that's just, once again, uh, good for manure and new uh, nutrition distribution. So find a good spot, not an area where the water is likely to pool, bring pipe and plumbing in to that, the middle of that spot. And you'll, you'll have your inlet and uh, we always recommend an overflow. And that's uh, just an extra pipe piped up to what the top just below, or sorry, just above what the shutoff point of that valve should be. And if that valve fails, to close and it continues to run over rather than going over the side of that tank it is going to go um, into the overflow valve and this will preserve your water blocks so you can see here that this is built up uh, we would you know recommend building a 12 inch high dirt pad around these installing geotextile fabric around it and then um, laying the pipe on, or sorry, laying the tire on top of the, the fabric that creates a seam, um, a seamless contact between the fabric and the tank. Because if you go ahead and put the tank on, and then you put the tire or the, the fabric around the tank, then you have that little bit of gap there, which water, dirt, and rocks can build up, and then you're going to have erosion working underneath, and it's just a gradual. It will. Uh, reduce the life of that watering block and the, the effects effects of that. Um, <clears throat> so once you set your dirt pad, it's important to 
pack it down and I'm sure you can go back and kind of look at these steps. But if you want to build a good water block, one that will last, these are the steps that you need to follow. Um, once again, uh, give me a, a shout or an email with any questions that you might have after this presentation or down the line, if you have questions, if something's not uh, making sense. So um, once you have the uh, tire on top of the plumbing and on the uh, geo fabric, you will go ahead and fill that inner tire space. Well, you can do one of two things. You can fill it with uh, up to about four inches from the top with sand and then cap it off with some concrete and it needs to be a soupy mix so you have good adhesion between the rubber and the mix. If it's you know, too dry, it's not going to adhere and you're going to have to do some remediation there, just maybe fill it up with some silicone. And the, the other option is to bolt, uh, bolt a, a flange piece on there, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that. Just something else that we can talk about later. All right, so finishing it up, we want to test the seal once that concrete has cured. Go ahead and turn on the system. Because you already have your water uh, supply in there, it'll go ahead and fill up. Fill up just to the rim or around the bead where a water just starts to spill on top of the concrete and observe for a while. It doesn't look like any leaks are occurring. Uh, and you can go ahead and just take precautionary measures and put a bead of silicone caulk around that uh, that contact point of the concrete and the tire tank. And so once all that's good, we don't have any links, uh, leaks. We don't. We, we'll go ahead and put to uh, a layer and you know several inches thick of two inch clean rock directly on top of the geotextile. And then we're going to top it off with the one inch base. That's going to create a very solid pad. Uh, it's cheaper than pouring a cement pad. And um, yeah, as you see here, it's kind of graded away from the tank. You know, I'd like that level area to be out just a little bit more. So when cattle are drinking, they're not pushing those rocks out towards the uh, the outside of the pad. And so if it was level, you wouldn't see that. But uh, nonetheless, this is a pretty, pretty decent pad. All right, a uh, couple different ways that people are using their tire tanks. This is a freeze proof water right here. Inside this uh, area, they actually piped down eight feet and installed corrugated piping and put in a geothermal tube and uh, what he's holding there is the, the cap to that, uh, insulated and all. And then they just have this drinking port right here that they, um, uh, they, they that's the only ish, uh, area that they will actually have to maybe remove ice out of. It's, uh, if it gets really, really cold. But once again, this is um, facing away from the, the prevailing winds, that's very important when you're putting in a frost-free system. Don't put it out in a wind-blown area. That just makes it that much easier to uh, freeze up. And then over here, the overflow. This is showing a dual valve system, and that's just uh, for higher recharge capabilities. But this, uh, this riser right here with the, the holes drilled in it, that is to prevent, you know, this... Uh, this grass and stuff and junk, you know, trash is to, from blocking the overflow. So the overflow is in there and it's just below where the shutout, the shutoff level is. But this is another means of um, protecting your overflow, which everybody should do. And then this is a, uh, an alternative option to building your raised dirt pad and your gravel layer water block area. They What they did is they took these uh, swamp mats and put it around and it looks like it's working okay. I have a question here. Bentonite. Not bentonite. I have read about bentonite being a good sealer, um, but have not used it.
Okay. Uh, another example. So this right here is of what is inside of that tire tank that um, with the, the cutout drinking port. This is the geothermal tube. The idea is, or um, what, what's happening is that it is dug um, well below frost level and the heat of the earth is heating all the water around this. Uh, very effective. Once again, just you know, plan your spot. Um, if you put a tire tank or any kind of tank on top of a concrete pad, concrete tends to absorb heat where dirt radiates, and you will uh, have colder, or you're more, more likely to freeze up on a concrete pad than you are on a dirt pad. So keep that in mind. This here is a Cobet water, and then this is uh, which I'm most people are familiar it still used geothermal heating and then this is a cascading tank which is a part of a system of uh cascading tanks uh each one is lower than the other one you have the um this is coming off a natural spring so you can see it coming out at the outlet right or the inlet right there and there is the the intake for the next tank, and it's also very efficient at keeping tanks open. It keeps the water moving and uh, ice-free. Perhaps, Wayne, I'm not sure on that. Um, of all the animals that I'm familiar with, Pigs are the ones that I have the least familiar with, familiar with. So I'm not sure what hog confinement flooring actually is. If it is anything like a swamp mat, uh, which, which it probably has to be, but I'm not sure. Um, I guess possibly. I don't. I don't know. Go ahead, Steve. No, I was just uh, going to see if. Wade had some clarification and, and Wade says that those are concrete slats on the floor of hog confinement buildings. So just to, uh, just to clarify, the question was is if you could use hog confinement flooring for around those, the base of those waterers and, and Wade says that the flooring would be concrete slats. Okay, if there's slats that allow water to pass through, I would say Say that you'd probably end up washing out your your pad, but uh, I need more clarification there. Well, just for um, the sake of time, though, Galen, I think we we need to probably power through and get to the uh, fencing portion here. I, I yeah, believe sorry, I believe that's in the next. Time on the <laughs> I just know that's your next slide or two. We're getting to fencing, and I want to make sure we spend some good time on that. I think there's a lot of interest in that. Okay, um, yeah, uh, so permanent fencing. This, uh, is a this is one of our spreadsheets and this is what we do for our customers and clients is we provide uh, cost estimates and this is this estimate and uh, never mind this number right here. This is actually what we're doing. Uh, let me back up there. Okay, um, this is for a quarter section. This is just an example, a quarter section, 160 acres, uh, perimeter fencing, let's assume that we're not next to a highway and we don't need you know, five strand along it. Um, we're just doing two strand uh, around the whole entire thing. And this 18,480 feet, that is representative of enclosing the entire area and then three subdivision fences um, with all of the material costs included the uh, from corner posts to wire everything uh, except for the energizer but I'll get to that that it equals out to just about 17 cents a foot a very economical I mean in today I don't understand why there, there are a few reasons why somebody should still install wo woven wire barbed wire I have a hard time believing that and I don't mean to offend anybody on that but that's, that's just what I believe. Um, so moving on, how you can make it work. I'm just gonna go ahead and skip that and getting started. So this is just kind of your, your normal setup. You've gone ahead and you put in the, uh, 
the end corner or the, the end brace. This is an angle brace. You want to put this uh, just the, the bottom about two thirds the height of the fence. And that is where you, uh, this is a seven foot, uh, about a six inch diameter end post. And then this is a four to five, six foot angle brace. And this will save you a lot of time rather than doing the traditional H brace that seems to be still pretty uh, prevalent in the, when, when guys go to build fences, especially ones that aren't too familiar with uh, modern fencing. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and skip this slide because I was more or less asking what, you know, what might've gone wrong there, but it's four strand wires don't cost much. Yeah, exactly, Margaret. It doesn't cost much to add wires once the corners are in. The corners are uh, the most expensive part of that. Uh, for perimeter sheet fencing, four to five wire, you can do it, um, you know, about every um, 10 inches, like the 10, 20, 30, 40. And it depends on the breed of sheep too, how high that should be. I've, um, you know, St. Croix, don't have to worry too much. Dorpers, they're going to jump and they're all kind of different. But um, this is just an example of a bad corner that was installed. All kinds of wrong things going on there. And really want to avoid all that. Um, so when we're running the wire out, it I don't want to skip this. It is very important to set the appropriate amount of pressure on the brake of that Jenny. Uh, you allow it to spin too much to just freewheel, you're gonna end up with a huge mess. And just kind of going back real quick to that slide, or sorry, there. This is the way that we prefer to send it out. We don't wanna put the Jenny on the ground and then pull the wire out you don't know what's going on at the Jenny and you almost always end up trashing the Jenny. So if you take care of it like this, even the cheapest one, uh, the cheapest one that we sell is $79.75 free shipping. It will last you as long as you take care of it as well as you see in this picture. Go slow, you know, maybe a brisk walking pace of five miles per hour or <laughs> light jog for some, but it will last you. So let me go ahead and speed up here. Um, you can take the fence anywhere. Th this is uh, um, just, I wish we could zoom out and <laughs> get a good idea of what that looks like, but this is really rough ground. And what this uh, fellow doing here is using a pilot driver to put a hole in so that we can put this pasture pro post into that hole. <clears throat> so the post that we use, the G2 poly post, um, this requires a core driver. This is uh, by PowerFlex. Um, great post. It actually has performed the best on our pivot system in Idaho. So uh, take into account that our pivots drive our yeah our pivots drive over our fences um, on purpose because we have feeder wires connecting our inner and outer circles, and we have elk pressure. Uh, all year round on these fences. We've never lost one of these posts. And so that's a pretty good testimony to the, the quality of these posts. And we use all these poly posts in there. We even have fiberglass posts, which I don't really talk about uh, in this presentation. I wish I had more time. I should have paced myself a little bit better, but so it goes. Um, this is the Patch Pro Composite Post. This is probably the most economical poly post that you can go with. Uh, fiberglass purchased locally um, or use T posts are almost always more economical than any other option. However, you do run the um, on T posts, you run the risk of shorting out. And on um, on the fiberglass posts, you can also short out because once uh, old ones, especially, they have so many different grooves and channels that when it rains, water collects in them and they can short out. So a uh, good idea there is to clean them off and go ahead and coat them with a layer of paint. 
Um, one thing about these is that these are approved for organic use, and yes, we do have some organic producers that use them for a fair reason. Uh, uh, this is the poly T post. Not a great idea, you know, picture of why that's called a T post, but there's a better one here. They are pre drilled, and um, of all the poly posts, they are definitely the most rigid. They are pre drilled every three inches, and um, I this is my take. They work great in almost uh, in a lot of environments, but like all poly products, when it uh, say in the Intermountain West up high, it gets real cold. In Canada, whatever gets high, or gets um, real, the temperatures drop. We are going to see some breakage. Even yeah, it's, we're going to see some post breaking. We're going to see it fail across all the poly posts. So. Um, just want to let that known. Uh, your best indestructible post, in my opinion, is actually your inch and a quarter sucker rod fiberglass post. That's a difficult post uh, to break, uh, pain to handle, but uh, very good quality or uh, longevity, I mean. <clears throat> okay. Um, so as far as tools, I don't want to spend too much time on this. You guys probably know a lot about um, building fence at least, but uh, these are just a couple ones. If you are thinking about building a fence, these are some tools that you will need to invest in. And you see how well <laughs> we've invested in this one. This uh, crimping tool has been around since I was a teenager and has, uh, man, we put up a lot of, uh, crimped a lot of sleeves with that and on a lot of fences. So, um, unfortunately, they uh, this crimping tool is no longer available. A good quality one will run you around a uh, oh, hundred bucks. Nico Press is a very popular one, and those run up in the uh, as well as Strain Ride. They run up near the, the two hundred dollar range, so it's kind of expensive. But it's a good idea to get one that will crimp more than one size of sleeve. This is 12 and a half gauge, and then you go move up here. And the reason why I say that is, one, you have your electrical uh, connections that are, are crimped, and then you will probably end up with, uh, at some point or another, some barbed wire on your place, whether uh, it's probably just inherited, but you, know, you might end up fixing it more times, um, more times than you want before you actually replace it. All right, next, uh, you need to invest in a decent spinning Jenny. And this is a complete must. It's extremely just reckless to try to unroll uh, this. This is a 4,000 foot roll of wire, 100 pounds, a lot of stored energy. Uh, try to unwind that without a Jenny. It's just not a good idea. And then the good thing is, is on temporary situ uh, areas, you know, leaf land where you do need to take your equipment back up, um, use these to wind it back up. And then you can tie them up just like this. It won't look as pretty as this. It certainly won't. I would suggest probably cutting it down to smaller sections, manageable sections, and then tying it, but uh, useful nonetheless. So, and then a good set of pliers and uh, a, a good brand is Crescent. I like the Crescent pliers, but most any will do for what I use it for, which is bending the wire to make tight loops around insulators. So uh, that is the key to making a beautiful fence is um, setting your pre-bends on your end terminal insulators. It, if you don't, you have these big loops that you know can fail. Uh, you can use the bull nose to prevent that, but nice tight loops just look better. They'll impress whoever you're showing. So, uh, this is kind of an optional tool. This is a chain grab, and that's just uh, this can be used as a an anchor or for anchoring to you know in this case a post. Or this also has a chain grab on this side where you can take two ends of separate wire and pull them together and uh, either splice them, install a strainer, whatever you need to do. And I say it's optional because in installing fence, you have strainers, and that's probably where your brakes are going to be. You can go ahead and add um, 
your strainers or you can put your join your wires together and go ahead and tighten them up and you don't need this but if you have a break pulling the wire together especially in the long run because the wire is going to shrink back it is pretty dang necessary uh, the next piece is use good insulators this on the left is the stay fix claw insulator if you need uh, an insulator that just you know you can hit with a hammer um, this is a nail on so it's designed to be nailed on and take quite a bit of abuse it just will hold up it's a beast of an insulator uh, put it down at the bottom of a dip of a uh, you know 100 foot ravine and with all of that you know, vertical pressure on it that is the insulator that I would count on to keep from pulling out if I was going to to do that if it was so steep like um, I would just put in you know some sort of anchoring wire so put in earth anchors or drive posts in where the and and then attach those the uh the posts are just to clarify there if you need to anchor at the bottom of a, a steep draw and a post just isn't an option like this sense of post putting uh, driving in a t-post or you know um T post works pretty well, but putting it all but you know six inches in the ground and then drilling a hole through it and attaching a wire and then pulling the wire down works pretty well there um, as far as holding the wire down. But these can take a, uh, a tremendous amount of strain. Same with this. This uh, going back to nice clean loops on your post and an insulator. That's uh, an example of, you know, putting some pre-bins in the wire with those pliers. It, you know, 200 PSI wire or 200,000 PSI wire is fairly difficult to bend, but with tools, it's not as difficult. Uh, wire strainers, this is a must. You need to tension up the wire and you can plan to place these about, um, you want them to, at about every quarter mile, but if you are, say if you have a straight run of a half mile, 2640, you could place one right in the middle and that would serve both quarter miles. So it, um, if you need any clarification on that, please drop me a line. Going the wrong direction here. All right, uh, these are, in my opinion, the best sleeves. These um, double barreled sleeves right here and this is the proper way to set that sleeve in the crimper when I was a kid sometimes I would turn it sideways wasn't so attentive and you would get little fissures or tears along that area and you're asking for trouble you're gonna fail but <laughs> so as an adult uh, don't make that mistake and place it in the teeth to where it fits snugly on our sides and then go ahead and compress it. And when you compress it, it should look like a, a, a perfect cylinder, a near perfect. You will have some excess material that kind of squeezes out the side, but that'll give you an idea of you know, what it should look like. And then the Energizer, moving on to that. And I was just trying to speed the presentation along, so kind of dived right into that. Energizers, cannot be understand. I wish I had actually started off with this. It is the, because if you're going to use electric fencing, you need to have an energizer that, um, that can produce a, a charge or a, uh, keep a voltage on the line that the cattle will fear. Electrical fence is a psychological barrier. It's hardly a, a physical barrier. So we need to keep them scared. So, uh, stay fix, stay fix, stay fix. That is, you know, what we push. There are uh, other energizers that, you know, work obviously, but and I, I would say a lot of those uh, former, I won't say any names, but owners of particular brands call me up and they say that such and such brand failed. I want to try this stay fix. I want to 
see what this was all about. And I have yet to anybody say to me that stay fix was a piece of junk. It's not. We've used stay fix for uh, well over 20 years and continue to do so. And it is seriously the backbone of our grazing operation. And then, um, so that was the mains powered. Uh, going on to dual power. Dual power means that it can be powered by either 110 or 12 volt. So you can tap into your mains or put a 12 volt battery, not just any 12 volt battery. That uh, should be a deep cycle marine battery. And if you want to get in, go down the rabbit hole of batteries, you certainly can. But there are deep uh, hybrid deep cycle batteries, and then there's true deep cycle batteries. But um, just for quick reference, the X1, you should put about on a, uh, say, and this is going to be put on a solar system, a 35 amp hour or around a 90, 80 RC reserve capacity battery is what you'd be looking for there. On the X6, uh, I would say no less than 100 amp hour. And then on the 18, no less than a 200 amp hour. Moving on there. Um, these are solar examples of solar units. This is a solar dolly. This is a self-contained uh, unit by TrueTest. And then this is their half jewel. And when we're sizing, um, there's, you can oversize pretty easily on a mains, but it's kind of reckless to do on a solar because it's a bit of more of an investment. And if you don't have the, if you don't have the um, required infrastructure, pretty much, uh, you know, if you're going to put a large energizer on a small polywire system, you're going to burn out your charger. It, it, you can. It, um, I've seen it where, uh, you know, an X6 on a polywire setup on a, you know, several operations where they just had polywire. It was too much um, output for that system. And then moving on to portable fencing and you know, you could talk forever and ever about portable fencing. I could anyway, but um, I would say the things that you need to take away, a three to one reel, that's a geared reel. So every time you turn the handle, that spool turns three times. A, a good, easy to use, light step and fence post, one that you don't have to worry about shorting out. Rebar, not great, you know, with the screw on insulators. Um, Pigtails, they have their own shortcomings. And this uh, post over here, this is the O'Brien's Treadline. This, we've used this post. We have posts from before our move to Idaho. So moved to Idaho from Missouri in 2004. We still have posts from uh, Missouri from our time there. This is the, the Terragate geared reel by far and away, uh, our most popular reel. And this is PowerFlex's. Uh, nine strand poly braid right there. And we, I just talk a little bit about poly braid. There's several different types. I don't see too much, um, really much of a point of going with anything less than nine strand. And then you decide whether or not you need not, uh, stainless steel or mixed metals. Well, mixed metals is more conductive. How conductive? It's 10 times more conductive than the nine stainless. But uh, steel has a higher tensile strength. So if you're at the end of your run, locking your reel and then really pulling on it to get it tight, which you shouldn't do, you could be kind of stressing the conductors in there and wearing them out. Um, but we do expect all of these products, uh, if you take care of them, easily last you five years. I would be shocked if you didn't see them, you know, especially this one over here, the O'Brien Treadline, lasting you 10, 15, 20. You might lose some of these clips right here, but this is the only plastic post that you can take out the box and bend into, and it won't snap on you. It's just incredible. And 
it'll continue to perform season after season, you know, through uh, summer um, heat to winter's cold, it'll hold up. And then um, that's just to emphasize my point, portable tension should be easy to set up and take down. Uh, you know, even my dad, he says he's a little bit slower. He used to be able to put up um, and take down fence in about 18 minutes, and that's uh, about 800 feet of poly grade and, and posts. And he, he slowed down a little bit, but he's still doing it at, uh, you know, near 63. And I know guys that are older than him still doing it. So anyway, that's, I'd like to just say good luck. Thank you for listening. And, um, and thank you, Steve, for allowing me to, to speak with your group. I know Steve has a lot of respect for you guys. He's talked about you as you are, um, you're well learned people. So <laughs> anyway, this is uh, concluding presentation and we'll finish on that nice picture there. Awesome. Thank you, Galen. Um, sorry to, sorry to rush you through that last bit. Um, I know you could, I know we could probably have you talk all night on this stuff. You got a wealth of knowledge, so we do appreciate you taking the time. Um, but, but we can take a few more minutes if anybody has some questions on, you know, what you just heard from Galen, if you've got something you want to ask, we can take a few minutes. Also, um, Galen obviously is willing to take your questions through email. So that's really generous of you. We appreciate that. Um, Galen, on your last topic there on that portable fencing, I was um, curious. We have some members who will um, who use electro netting. You know, if they've got maybe smaller scale livestock, do you have any thoughts or experience with pros and cons of using multiple strands of that woven uh, versus electro netting? Yeah, and that's something I wish I could have got into, for sure. Um, I use electro netting for sheep and goats. Um, on small scale, works great. I know guys that are putting 10 uh, rolls of electro netting together, uh, the, the poultry netting, in order to do strip grazing with their chickens. And it's, um, that would be uh, McIntyre's out of Caldwell, Idaho. But yeah, so pretty extensive. I think Hitfield actually does some of that too. Uh, the seven sons outfit so oh yeah but, yeah we had uh, we had bryce from seven sons last last year talk to us sure yeah um you do have the, the disadvantage of all those multiple wires shorting out your fence so you end up with lower than normal voltage you know it's it's difficult to charge uh netting and so you do need to definitely size up your charger to accommodate that. Uh, I have a three jewel charger on six rolls of the 164 netting and it works great. Keeps uh, the sheep are easy. <laughs> they can go to two strands, but uh, the goats are a little bit, a little bit more challenging. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too. Is is just the trouble with with making sure that that's hot. Um, cool. Well, I'm not seeing any uh, questions come in the chat box at the moment right now, unless someone's typing one. Galen, one question, I guess, since we had to whip through some of these slides, um, what do you think? Would it be possible to share this PDF with those who tuned in tonight, this, this, so they can go back through and flip through the slides themselves? Absolutely, and. I'm sorry, my cadence was not, uh, you know, what I really wanted, but no problem. As I get comfortable, I'd love to, you know, be able to speak more on it. And but by all means, share as much as you'd like, and hopefully, you know, I get some uh, people calling me and asking me questions. I love to talk to uh, the the new grazers are the ones that are are really fun to talk to, and as well as it looks I, you know what, I need to learn, I need to learn things too. So I love talking to um, pretty much anybody that will call me and yeah. you know, has, a, has an idea. 
And you know what, Galen, that's how your name came up on our list for inviting you to do this farm in ours, because one of our board members, Wendy, said she had called, uh, you know, called your American Grazing Lands for some questions and said she chatted with you for quite a while and just thought you were a wealth of information. So she recommended that we reach out to you and get pick your brain on some of this stuff. So, um, so we appreciate that. Yeah. That, cool. Well, um, I think we ought to maybe just wrap it up then. I don't see any questions in here. Everybody just saying thank you and good job. So um, it, for everybody that tuned in, I'll go ahead and email out a PDF of these slides if you want to go back through those. Um, and Galen, thanks a whole lot for putting these together and for taking the time to share with us tonight. We really appreciate it.